city of New York was actually experiencing a massive nervous breakdown. There was palpable fear in the hearts of people in the streets of the city at night. One man terrorized 16 million people. This was a mystery. Nobody had even a clue as to who was doing this. Well, I lost my ability to love, have compassion. I became an animal. For 13 months, David Berkowitz prowled the streets, looking for young women to kill. He called himself the Son of Sam and stirred up the emotions of hardened New Yorkers with his haunting words and hateful deeds. On Christmas Eve, 1975, David Berkowitz attacked a 14-year-old girl with a knife. As he tried to stab the girl through her winter coat, she screamed and struggled in his arms. Berkowitz cut himself with the knife. It was so traumatically horrible to him that he vowed that he could never do that again. But then his mind went to work and he tried to figure out a different way to do it. At his next attempt, and all the ones to follow, Berkowitz would use a far more impersonal weapon. I became virtually a killing machine, a, just a machine of destruction. In the summer of 1953, Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz adopted a three-day-old boy and brought him home to their small apartment in the Bronx. Little David was a blessing because the couple couldn't have children of their own. One of David's earliest memories was his parents telling him that he was adopted and that his real mother had died giving birth to him. Every time he and his parents would pass the Bronx County Courthouse where the surrogate's court is located, they would point to it, tell him that that's where the judge awarded him to them because they loved him more than anybody in the world. Nathan Berkowitz worked six long days a week running a hardware store. Pearl was a homemaker who loved to show off her little boy. While David's childhood seemed normal enough, including Little League and occasional trips to Yankee Stadium with his father, David sensed early on that there was something wrong, something he could not express. My parents had such great hopes for me. They tried to raise me as best as I could, you know, and they fed me and clothed me and, and, and gave me love, but uh, uh, there was just something in me that would not respond to that love and pushed it away. I was so self-destructive. When David fought with other boys in the neighborhood, they would taunt him, saying, you're not a real kid, you're adopted. Maybe it's sort of like a Pinocchio sense, you know, he was trying to be this real, live, biological boy and somehow knowing that he was adopted made him feel less than genuine from day one. Worse than the shame he felt over being adopted was his guilt, knowing that his biological mother had died in childbirth. He would lie awake at night fearing that his father was going to come and murder him in his bed because he had killed his biological mother. David's dark imagination was fueled by the many horror films he watched on television. He suffered from terrible nightmares, but was often too frightened even to speak about them. He would actually get in his closet, uh, cover up with clothes and blankets that may have been in there, and stay there for hours, his family not even knowing where he was, uh, tormented by these uh, nightmares. Berkowitz hated school and would run home as fast as he could to be with his mother, whom he adored. She was only too happy to dote on her only child. David, in turn, secretly poisoned his mother's parakeet to eliminate what he regarded as a rival for her affections. She never suspected her little angel. Despite David's adoration for his mother, he could also be cruel to her. We were talking about his aggression during childhood, and he described it this way. 
I was very vicious, you know, and mean towards her, meaning his adoptive mother, and used to throw things at her and hurl insults at her. When David was 10, his mother took him to see a child psychologist, but it didn't help. David was a secretive child, and no one was allowed into his world. When he was a uh, preteen, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, he w would tell about climbing out the window at night, down the fire escape, and roam the streets of New York City. Uh, he said, like an alley cat. The dark city alleys were a stark contrast to the light that David's mother brought into their home. Following Jewish tradition, she lit the Sabbath candles every Friday night. At the age of 13 in 1966, David had his bar mitzvah and read from the Bible in Hebrew. But the burden of his Jewish heritage only exacerbated his deep-rooted feelings of shame. I'm not a proud Jew, he later wrote. Jews are supposed to be honest, law-abiding, and respectful of parents. I am none of these. I am a disgrace. One night, shortly after his bar mitzvah, in a fit of adolescent rage, David said something cruel to his mother that he would have to live with for the rest of his life. She was on her way out to go to dinner, and he screamed at her, I hate you, I hate you, I hope you die. And essentially, that was the last time he saw her alive. Um, unbeknownst to anyone, she was in the advanced stages of breast cancer and collapsed at dinner that evening. The only person he really felt close to in the whole world wasted away in the cancer ward and then died. David cried for days. I was a lot closer to my mom than I was to my dad. My dad, I mean, he had to work all the time, six days a week. It wasn't his fault. And then I really, I had, had trouble, lots of trouble all through my youth, you know, emotional problems and things, mental problems. And uh, when she died, of course, then I lost everything. David's loneliness intensified. He was extremely shy and blushed easily, especially around girls. He would ride his bike for hours, often to his mother's grave. He lingered in the cemetery, fascinated by the tombstones of people who died young. He wondered if the girls had been pretty. My dad used to cry and plead with me to come and talk with him. And, I, and he says, I don't even know you. You're my son. You're like a stranger. That's just the way I was. I don't know why. You know, it was just these blocks that were up where I just didn't want to share. Nothing that was on my mind. Nothing that was on my heart. I was a closed book, and that was that. Because of his chronic truancy, David barely graduated from high school. In 1971, the 18-year-old Berkowitz enlisted in the Army. He was full of patriotic fervor and fantasized about dying a heroic death in Vietnam. Instead, he was shipped to Korea and qualified as a sharpshooter with an M16 rifle. He tried to find a girlfriend among the Korean prostitutes who hung around the base, but he found the effort degrading. David wrote to his father, apologizing for being a burden and amounting to nothing in society. He wrote that he was sorry he turned out the way he did. Stupid, hateful, ugly, destructive. Berkowitz begged his father to pretend he never had a son, to forget that he even existed. In 1973, as Berkowitz turned 20, the Army transferred him to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Out of his longing for companionship, he became involved with a Baptist church. He attended classes, read dozens of books, and soon was baptized. He was particularly impressed about how families were together on Sundays and when they prayed together. And he wanted this to be part of this group very, very much. All the preaching about evil, sin, and eternal damnation, however, constantly reminded Berkowitz of the bleak future that awaited him in hell. His religious fervor quickly extinguished. Berkowitz was also discovering that the army was no place for him. After a series of disciplinary problems, he was discharged in 1974 and returned to New York. Eager for a fresh start, he enrolled at Bronx Community College, his father, too, had made a fresh start. Nathan remarried and decided to move to Florida and retire. Berkowitz resented his new stepmother and her daughter for invading his home and taking away his father. 
The 21-year-old began to feel that there was a mysterious force around him that repelled people. He referred to himself as Dishmutz, Yiddish for dirty one. His world was rapidly shrinking. Berkowitz moved into his own apartment and got a job as a warehouse security guard on the docks of the west side of Manhattan. From the depths of his loneliness, he began to think about the birth mother he never knew, the one whose death weighed on his conscience. Berkowitz would soon unravel the mystery of who he really was. What he found would propel him onto the street in search of blood. David Berkowitz began a desperate quest at the age of 21 to find out exactly whose son he really was. But instead of saving him from his misery, his journey to discover his birth parents would launch Berkowitz on a year-long killing spree. He had gone to one of these Freedom of Adoption Movement meetings and told them the story of how his mother had died giving birth to him, and he had a father out there somewhere, and people laughing at him, and said, you know, what are you laughing about? This is a tragedy. You know, my mother died. They said, man, that's what they tell all of us. Berkowitz called his adoptive father, Nathan, and demanded the truth. Nathan broke the news that David's birth mother was in fact alive. He explained that the adoption experts had advised against revealing the truth. Berkowitz was stunned. In an instant, he was delivered from a lifetime of guilt. He had not caused his mother's death after all. Berkowitz's adoption papers said that his real name was Richard David Falco and that his parents were Betty and Tony Falco. He searched for them for months, but he kept hitting dead ends. Frustrated and lonely, Berkowitz, who had tried during his army years to find comfort in religion, now joined a cult of Satan worshippers. Berkowitz enjoyed the late night rituals in the woods, the chanting, the drugs, and the opportunity to meet girls. He connected easily to the dark forces that the group worshipped. He even made a blood pact to serve the devil. I was chanting the names of Lucifer over and over, and I was calling out to him. I said, oh, you know, son of the morning, and, and uh, prince, my prince, my lord, you know, come into, my, uh, come into me right now, take control of this vessel. And uh, I felt like I was being emptied of my own personality, and that something else somehow was coming in. The group gave Berkowitz a sense of belonging to a family, and he eagerly accepted their mission. His other mission, to track down his biological parents, was finally accomplished after a year of searching. When he first spoke on the phone with his birth mother, Betty Falco, David's expectations soared. At last, he had found his normalness, his, his, his biology, the reason for his existence. And what he thought would be this glorious moment when he would find his real live mom, and they would fall lovingly into each other's arms, turned into one of the moments, if not the moment, of his greatest disappointment. Berkowitz had fantasized about meeting a beautiful woman. What he found was a totally ordinary person, what he described as a nervous and frightened little woman. Betty apologized profusely for abandoning her little Richie. I remember him mimicking her and saying, Oh, Richie, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in this sort of high, whiny voice, and putting his hands over his ears as he did that to try to shut out the sound that he recalled her making. Berkowitz hid his disappointment and told Betty that he loved her and forgave her because he knew she must have had a good reason for giving him up. Betty revealed to David that Tony Falco wasn't his real father. Betty Falco had secrets, too. Betty, a daughter of poor Jewish immigrants, had married Tony as a teenager. After they had a daughter named Rosalind, Tony left Betty for another woman. Betty had then begun a long affair with Joseph Kleinman, a well-to-do Jewish businessman who was married with three children. In 1953, David was born. Kleinman would not tolerate the embarrassment of an illegitimate child. Betty, too, felt guilty and ashamed and quickly made arrangements for an adoption. He learns at the moment of his imagined rebirth 
that he had intruded upon the lives of these two people who were simply together having sex. Berkowitz's relief over not having killed his birth mother quickly turned to anger. He later wrote, Here I was, never wanting to be born in the first place, miserable, maladjusted, plagued with death fantasies, only to find out that I was unwanted, an accident after all. This moment of truth lit a fuse in Berkowitz, but he never let his feelings show. For a while, he even maintained a relationship with his half-sister and her two daughters, who called him Uncle Richie and would jump into his arms when he arrived for dinner. His sister seemed to be going out of her way to try to make up for all the things which he hadn't had, and as much as he wanted to believe it, he knew that it was it was false, that, that he was still this sort of counterfeit human being. He was adopted. Berkowitz's visits grew less and less frequent, then stopped altogether. He later wrote, I was getting a very powerful urge to kill most of my natural family. I fought hard to keep these thoughts from becoming actions. So I just stayed away altogether. The 22-year-old Berkowitz mysteriously told his half-sister that he would never hurt her or her daughters. Instead, on Christmas Eve, 1975, Berkowitz attacked a 14-year-old girl in the Bronx with a small knife. The rage David had managed to keep under control for so long was starting to crack through his quiet exterior. The attack was too close a physical encounter for the withdrawn Berkowitz. The girl fought back, screamed, and escaped. Berkowitz decided that next time he'd use a gun. That Christmas Eve, a serial killer was born. In the bicentennial spring of 1976, Berkowitz was still working as a night watchman, but he complained that he couldn't sleep during the day because of howling dogs belonging to his landlord. He quit his job and moved to an apartment on the Hudson River outside the city, only to find more incessantly barking dogs in his new neighborhood. From 1976 to 1977, Berkowitz drove a taxi, worked in the post office, and tried to live with his paranoid feelings. He would often drive to the beach and sleep in his car for a few hours of peace. At the beach, David took long walks trying to sort out his scrambled mind. One day, he made a decision. As he later explained in a letter, I was determined that I must slay a woman for revenge purposes. For all the suffering, mental suffering, they cause me. The 23-year-old Berkowitz paid a brief visit to his adoptive father in Florida. Nathan witnessed his son staring in the mirror, pounding his head with his hands. He tried to get David psychiatric help, but the young man refused, saying no one could help him, that it was too late. When Berkowitz left Florida, his vengeful fantasies grew more concrete. He drove to Houston to visit an old army buddy who innocently helped Berkowitz buy a 44 caliber bulldog revolver to protect himself, Berkowitz said, on the long trip back to New York. Out of the darkness of his rage, the weapon was his final solution. In his tormented mind, the barking of the dogs became unbearable. With his anger and sexual frustrations mounting, it was just a matter of time before Berkowitz would express himself with his gun. The demons inside David Berkowitz were driving him to hunt the dark streets of New York City in search of a woman to kill. Only that would free him from his torment. On July 29, 1976, Jody Valenti was dropping off her friend Donna Loria in the Bronx. Berkowitz drove by and saw the two girls laughing and talking. He parked his car two blocks away and walked back. Then he circled the car at a distance, like an animal stalking its prey. Jody turned her head and saw Berkowitz's piercing eyes. She said, who's that? As Donna turned to look, Berkowitz pulled his gun out of a brown paper bag and fired. In the silence that followed, Berkowitz was frozen. Jody pounded the car horn. 
Berkowitz popped out of his trance and ran. Donna's father burst out of the apartment building, screaming for help as he gathered his daughter in his arms. But she was already dead. Jody survived a bullet wound in her thigh and was able to give police a description of the killer. As Berkowitz fled in his 1970 yellow Ford Galaxy, he sang happily to himself. I felt some peace, he later said. While I didn't have a physical sexual orgasm, I certainly had a mental one. After a shooting, it was like I was walking on air. He didn't know if he had killed anyone until he read the New York Post that afternoon. After that, Berkowitz was out every week, cruising neighborhoods that bordered highways. In the fall of 76, he wounded two more young women, as well as a man who he probably mistook for a woman in the darkness. Donna DeMasi was shot in the neck. Joanne Lomino was paralyzed from the waist down. And Carl De Niro would end up with a metal plate in his head. Berkowitz was nervous during these first few attacks because he realized he was crossing over the greatest moral divide. I was cognizant of finally being able to pass that point in which a human plays God, he would later confess. I was anxious, excited, and tense. Berkowitz also got excited over the thought of being a hero. He fantasized about rushing into a burning building and saving women and children. Almost every night when he was driving around looking for someone to kill, um, he always had a full emergency pack in the back of his car, at the same time looking for someone to save. On a frigid night in January 1977, Berkowitz, with his gun in his pocket, cheerfully helped some stranded teenagers push their car out of a snowbank. And yet, later that very same night, Berkowitz crossed paths with Wall Street secretary Christine Freund, who was in a parked car with her boyfriend. She was shot and killed. Her boyfriend was unharmed. Up to this point, police still had no clue that the murders were related. The detective assigned to Freund's case sent the bullets to the ballistics lab for analysis. I walked into the ballistics unit in the police academy. I met with George Simmons, and my purpose of going there was to meet him specifically, not his boss, not another ballistics detective, but him, because I had a lot of faith in him. And as I walked in, he said to me, Joe, we have a psycho here. Simmons explained that he had seen the same bullets in three other shootings since July. He was convinced they all came from the same rare kind of pistol, but he couldn't prove it yet. The fifth attack took place on March 8th, five weeks after the murder of Christine Freund and less than 100 yards away in Queens. Virginia Vaskaritschian, a college student, had come to the U.S. with her family from Bulgaria and only a year before had been made an American citizen. It was 7.30 in the evening when she was walking home from classes. This guy walks up to her and she sees the gun in the face and puts her school books in front of her and he fires through the school books and puts a bullet in her brain. This time, police were able to match the bullets to the first murder. No one could deny that there was a serial killer on the loose. The police dubbed him the 44 caliber killer and braced for him to strike again. Panic seized the city. Women cut their hair short and dyed it blonde because they thought the killer was gunning for long-haired brunettes. I thought about the 44 caliber killer every day since it happened. I go to beauty school up the block, and most of the girls are wearing their hair up because they're afraid of the 44 caliber killer. They wear it up. One thing that I really don't do anymore is sit in parked cars. A month after Virginia was murdered, in April 1977, Berkowitz wrote his neighbor, Sam Carr, a very sober letter saying he would take legal action unless Carr took care of his howling dog. In this letter, Berkowitz revealed his longing for companionship, writing about a wife who didn't exist. He explained that he and his wife tried to take time off to be together. Just the two of us, he wrote, to sleep late, to make love, to read, etc. But the barking and the howling continued, and we had no peace. Berkowitz got no response from Sam Carr. The following week, he was on the hunt again. At 3 a.m. on April 17th, he was headed home when he saw two heads over the seat of a car. This was uh, probably the worst night of my career. 
Uh, I was in charge of the nighttime detail. And we always felt, in, in investigating homicides, people are creatures of habit. So we always cover the areas where they already hit. Less than four blocks from where Donna Loria was killed, Berkowitz waited as a patrol car passed by and disappeared. He walked toward the car, dropped a note at the scene, and then fired. Valentina Suriani and Alexander Esau were both shot and killed instantly. The note Berkowitz had dropped at the crime scene was the first solid lead for the police. It said, I am deeply hurt by your calling me a woman hater. I am not, but I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. I love to hunt, he wrote, prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat. I don't want to kill anymore, no sir, no more, but I must honor thy father. I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't belong on earth. He ended with a warning. Let me haunt you with these words. I'll be back. I'll be back. Berkowitz had raised the stakes and police responded. A task force was formed to coordinate the search for the killer. It was the most extensive manhunt in the history of New York. Somebody came up with the theory that the M.O. of this particular shooter was exactly the same as a scenario on Starsky and Hutch. We sat and watched every Starsky and Hutch episode. That's how minute we got about this thing. A few days after Valentina and Alexander were murdered, Berkowitz wrote another letter to Sam Carr, saying that his life was destroyed and he had nothing to lose anymore. I can see there shall be no peace in my life until I end yours. A week later, Berkowitz shot and wounded Sam Carr's dog. The New York papers appealed to him to turn himself in. Berkowitz responded with a dark, chilling poem to the Daily News. It read, Hello from the gutters of New York City, which are filled with dog manure, vomit, stale wine, urine, and blood. I am still here, like a spirit roaming the night, thirsty, hungry, seldom stopping to rest, anxious to please Sam. I love my work. Now the void has been filled. On June 26, 1977, Berkowitz staked out a disco in Queens. Sal Lupo and Judy Placido were wounded, but survived. Because he was faceless, because he was coming out of the shadows, because he would strike from behind, everybody figured anywhere they were, this guy could be over the hedge or around the corner waiting to get you. There was palpable fear in the hearts of people in the streets of the city at night. One man terrorized 16 million people. As the first anniversary of the killing spree approached, the city still cowered in fear, wondering who the son of Sam really was and what he had in store for them next. By July 1977, as the first anniversary of Donna Loria's murder approached, one paper boldly proclaimed, Death Day. Another asked, Tell us, Sam, what have you planned for us tonight? The streets were eerily quiet on the night of July 29th, and it passed without incident. Two days later, on July 31st, Stacy Moskowitz and Robert Violante went out on a date in Brooklyn. Before Stacy left, she and her sister joked that the odds of crossing paths with the son of Sam were a million to one. That night, Berkowitz was hiding in the park as Stacy and Robert parked their car. He watched them as they played on the swings. Back in their car, they were kissing passionately. Berkowitz fired four bullets into the passenger side window. He stood there mesmerized and then ran. Robert Violante lost one eye and was partially blinded in the other. Stacy Moskowitz lived for 39 hours and then died. The entire city felt they'd lost a child. And the atmosphere the next day of the city changed from this terror to an anger and sympathy. You know, we're going to get you, you son of a bitch. Whatever happens, we're going to get you. 
By now, Son of Sam was so notorious that Stacy's murder made headlines all over the world. What he was doing was manipulating, dominating, and controlling society. And now this insignificant nobody, someone who feels like he's one grain of sand on a beach with billions and billions of grains of sand, he is important, and he finally has arrived. It was only then that the son of Sam gave police the clue that would lead to his arrest. The night he killed Stacy Moskowitz, Berkowitz watched the police write him a ticket for parking his Ford next to a fire hydrant. A week later, he dutifully paid the ticket by mail. The police traced the license plate cited on the ticket to the name David Berkowitz. They quickly discovered that he had been sending harassing letters to a number of people and that a man named Sam Carr claimed Berkowitz had shot his dog. Out of a pile of hundreds of tips and complaints from the public, Berkowitz's name appeared three times. On August 10, 1977, a large team of detectives staked out Berkowitz's apartment. The end was anticlimactic. Berkowitz walked out of the apartment building with a brown paper bag and got into his car. A detective approached the car and told him to freeze. Berkowitz turned around and said, Well, you finally got me. The officer asked, Who do I have? Berkowitz said matter-of-factly, The son of Sam. On the seat next to him in a brown paper bag is the 44 caliber gun that did all the shootings. No resistance, no shootout, no nothing. You got me. You got the son of Sam. The police brought him in for questioning and the media descended on them. He came almost in a, a spotlight. There was a surreal feeling about it. We're finally putting a face to horror and terror. Berkowitz confessed to all of the Son of Sam murders, revealing details that only the killer could know. He enjoyed talking about it. Uh, he enjoyed being able to give us what we and he only knew. Facing the public for the first time, Berkowitz could not keep from smiling. Berkowitz showed no obvious sign of his dark, vengeful interior. He was cooperative and polite. When detectives asked him why he had paid his parking ticket, he responded, because I am a law-abiding citizen. At a news conference, Nathan Berkowitz, now 68 years old, expressed his grief for the families of the victims. So forth. Did you have any possible thought it might be David? No, I did not. Upon learning that it is allegedly he what was your immediate reaction and how did you get the news i cried <laughs> uh, i think that's an up gentleman with respect to any uh, any further berkowitz said he had been ordered to kill by demons originating from his neighbor sam carr who he claimed was the devil in human form for eight months berkowitz was held in a bare tiled room in the prison ward of the king's county hospital a hearing was scheduled to determine if he was mentally fit to proceed to trial. During the first few weeks of his incarceration, guards reported that the son of Sam ate like a horse and slept like a baby. He rarely got upset and seemed to be indifferent to his plight. In tape-recorded interviews with psychiatrists, the son of Sam tried to explain himself. And I had nothing against these victims, nor were these people to me. They were just people. I I didn't hate them. I wasn't angry against them. So why did you do it? Well, Sam did it through me. He used me. He made me go out there and do it. He, I did it for him, for blood. Right outside Berkowitz's window at the Kings County Hospital, a death rally was staged. Many New Yorkers were filled with bitter hatred for Berkowitz, but none more so than the parents of the six murdered and seven wounded young adults. After I saw what had happened to my boy's left eye, I had wished that his eyes could be taken out of his head for Robert's sake. And I hope he lives a long time with this in his heart. And I hope he never has a minute's peace. Never. Never. Just once I want to get my hands around his throat. 
he took something from me. So wouldn't you feel the same way? You'd, you'd want to get revenge, wouldn't you? And, and if anybody tells me no, I tell them they're sick. Mike Loria and millions of other New Yorkers, and I have to say myself too, said, you know, yeah, he's got problems, mental problems, but he deserves to die. He deserves to die for what he did. Sitting in his cell, Berkowitz began to feel the same way. Suicidal feelings overwhelmed him. In a letter, he wrote that he was a cursed person beyond hope. The court ruled that Berkowitz was fit to stand trial. Ignoring his lawyer's advice, Berkowitz decided to plead guilty and be punished for his crimes. He asked to be put away forever so he would not kill again. Berkowitz wrote to his father begging him to accept his decision to plead guilty. Once again, he told his father, I failed you, but it's over now. Please, let me have a little peace. In May 1978, the son of Sam pleaded guilty to six murders. A few weeks later, on the day of his sentencing, David threw a tantrum and broke the restraints on his straitjacket. The officers subdued Berkowitz and brought him into the courtroom. They bring him into court, and he's subdued, but he looks around, he spots Nasa Moskowitz, and he starts yelling at her, Stacy was a whore! Stacy was a whore! Before they could drag him out, Berkowitz screamed, That's right, I'd kill her again. I'd kill them all again. Nasa Moskowitz was standing up screaming at him, You son of a bitch! You killed my daughter! You're gonna get killed yourself! It was, a, it was an astounding moment. Berkowitz was dragged from the courtroom biting and kicking. The sentencing was postponed. On June 13th, a greatly subdued Berkowitz stood before the court. The judge said, It is this court's fervent wish that the defendant be imprisoned until the day of his death. The judge added that Berkowitz was an animal, and he wished he could have given him the death penalty. He was sentenced to six 25-year-to-life consecutive terms and began his incarceration at the notorious Attica Prison in upstate New York. The following year, in February 1979, Berkowitz announced that he had made up the story about the demons. At a press conference from Attica, he said he never heard voices, he was not insane, and he wanted nothing except to be left alone and to spend the rest of his life in prison. Later that same year, Berkowitz was almost killed by another inmate. Fearing retribution, Berkowitz refused to name his attacker. Following the attempt on his life, Berkowitz seemed to become more introspective about his crimes. He wrote in a letter that he did hate women, especially women who dance, he wrote, I hate their sensuality. Berkowitz told a fellow inmate that he attacked women kissing in cars in order to prevent other illegitimate children from being born to suffer the way he did. Berkowitz settled into Attica and seemed to find some peace. For the next 14 years, he kept his silence with the public. Then, in 1993, Berkowitz came forward and revealed a new twist to the Son of Sam story that would capture the public's imagination once again. In 1993, David Berkowitz, after maintaining his silence in prison for 14 years, made a sensational announcement. He claimed that the Son of Sam killings were really the result of a satanic plot, that he had only killed three people, but was an accomplice in the others. Berkowitz said the satanic cult he had joined in the early 70s had lured him into a conspiracy to bring chaos to New York City through a series of murders. I didn't know, I honestly didn't know that people were going to die one day. And I'm so very sorry that happened. And the people that didn't deserve it uh, would just lost their lives. And I know that... Uh, Berkowitz now claims that he pleaded guilty to all the crimes to get out of the cult and to protect his family from their vengeance. Experts who have studied Berkowitz's criminal behavior find the story unbelievable. David Berkowitz is a paranoid individual. He's, he, can, he is not reliable. He is not the type of person that someone else would even want to team up with, nor is he the type of person that wants to share the glory with anyone else. He simply did it on his own. 
Berkowitz has been living in prison almost as long as he lived on the outside. In 1987, he moved to his present home at the Sullivan Correctional Facility, a super maximum security prison for notorious felons. Prison is a place of, 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 of oppressive darkness. There's nothing here. Just, just look. He would actually get in his closet, uh, cover up with clothes and blankets that may have been in there, and stay there for hours, his family not even knowing where he was, uh, tormented by these uh, nightmares. Berkowitz hated school and would run home as fast as he could to be with his mother, whom he adored. She was only too happy to dote on her only child. David, in turn, secretly poisoned his mother's parakeet to eliminate what he regarded as a rival for her affections. She never suspected her little angel. Despite David's adoration for his mother, he could also be cruel to her. We were talking about his aggression during childhood, and he described it this way. I was very vicious, you know, and mean towards her, meaning his adoptive mother, and used to throw things at her and hurl insults at her. When David was 10, his mother took him to see a child psychologist, but it didn't help. David was a secretive child, and no one was allowed into his world. When he was uh, pre-teen, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, he w would tell about climbing out the window at night down the fire escape and roam the streets of New York City. Uh. The city of New York was actually experiencing a massive nervous breakdown. There was palpable fear in the hearts of people in the streets of the city at night. One man terrorized 16 million people. This was a mystery. Nobody had even a clue as to who was doing this. Well, I lost my ability to love, have compassion. I became an animal. For 13 months, David Berkowitz prowled the streets, looking for young women to kill. He called himself the Son of Sam and stirred up the emotions of hardened New Yorkers with his haunting words and hateful deeds. Christmas Eve, 1975, David Berkowitz attacked a 14-year-old girl with a knife. As he tried to stab the girl through her winter coat, she screamed and struggled in his arms. Berkowitz cut himself with the knife. It was so traumatically horrible to him that he vowed that... And occasional trips to Yankee Stadium with his father. David sensed early on that there was something wrong, something he could not express. My parents had such great hopes for me. They tried to raise me as best as I could, you know, and they fed me and clothed me and, and, and gave me love, but uh, I, there was just something in me that would not respond to that love and pushed it away. I was so self-destructive. When David fought with other boys in the neighborhood, they would taunt him, saying, you're not a real kid, you're adopted. Maybe it's sort of like a Pinocchio sense, you know, he was trying to be this real, live, biological boy and somehow knowing that he was adopted made him feel less than genuine from day one. Worse than the shame he felt over being adopted was his guilt, knowing that his biological mother had died in childbirth. He would lie awake at night, fearing that his father was going to come and murder him in his bed because he had killed his biological mother. David's dark imagination was fueled by the many horror films he watched on television. He suffered from terrible nightmares, but was often too frightened even to speak about them. This is like an alley cat. The dark city alleys were a stark contrast to the light that David's mother brought into their home. Following Jewish tradition, she lit the Sabbath candles every Friday night. At the age of 13 in 1966, David had his bar mitzvah and read from the Bible in Hebrew. But the burden of his Jewish heritage only exacerbated his deep-rooted feelings of shame. 
I'm not a proud Jew, he later wrote. Jews are supposed to be honest, law-abiding, and respectful of parents. I am none of these. I am a disgrace. One night, shortly after his bar mitzvah, in a fit of adolescent rage, David said something cruel to his mother that he would have to live with for the rest of his life. She was on her way out to go to dinner, and he screamed at her, I hate you, I hate you, I hope you die. And essentially, that was the last time he saw her alive. Um, unbeknownst to anyone, she was in the advanced stages of breast cancer and collapsed at dinner that evening. The only person he really felt close to in the whole world wasted away in the cancer ward and then died. David cried for days. I was a lot closer to my mom than I was to my dad. My he could never do that again. But then his mind went to work and he tried to figure out a different way to do it. At his next attempt, and all the ones to follow, Berkowitz would use a far more impersonal weapon. I became virtually a killing machine. A, just a machine of destruction. In the summer of 1953, Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz adopted a three-day-old boy and brought him home to their small apartment in the Bronx. Little David was a blessing because the couple couldn't have children of their own. One of David's earliest memories was his parents telling him that he was adopted and that his real mother had died giving birth to him. Every time he and his parents would pass the Bronx County Courthouse, where the surrogate's court is located, they would point to it, tell him that that's where the judge awarded him to them because they loved him more than anybody in the world. Nathan Berkowitz worked six long days a week running a hardware store. Pearl was a homemaker who loved to show off her little boy. While David's childhood seemed normal enough, including Little League, 